I got in last night, the hotel bar was bumping. So if you were there and you're here, you're pros. You're, you're my people. I like, the, uh, I like the hungover section here in the front with the couches. That's a, an idea we're going we're gonna to take to the beer business, I promise. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Nick. As Stacy said, I am the director of marketing at Elysian Brewing uh, up in good old Seattle, Washington. That's two states to the north, if you're unfamiliar. Uh, Elysian Brewing is one of the top 15 craft breweries in the country. Uh, it's a super fun industry. I've been doing it for quite a while, um, and I'm really excited to talk to everybody today about all of the hard-won lessons I've learned in the beer business about how we stand out in this crazy sea of sameness. So a little bit about me, I'm from God's country, good old Eugene, Oregon. Uh, I loved growing up there, little tiny college town. I did go to the Harvard of the West Coast, as it's known, the, uh, the University of Oregon, or as Harvard's known, the University of Oregon of the East. There I studied finance or finance, depending upon where you're from in the country. My dad was from Indiana, so it was a degree in finance. Shout out to good old Bruce. After I graduated, I moved down to Scottsdale, Arizona. Anybody from Arizona in the room? Yes. How do you get a kid from Oregon to move down to Arizona? You invite him to come out in February, right? It's pouring down rain. It's super freezing cold in Oregon. You go to Scottsdale. It's 85 degrees. It's sunny every day. You're like, oh, my God, why doesn't everybody live here? So I moved down in May. Then July hit. And I'm like, I, I live on the surface of the sun. This is the surface of the sun. So I had a friend of mine who was in the lending business. He's like, hey, you know, well, the, the real estate market is literally and figuratively on fire in Scottsdale. Come on down and, and learn the lending business. So I walk into this office. Hey, everybody, degree in finance, your savior's here. And they go, hey, Nick, good to have you. Sit at the front desk. You're going to be the receptionist for six months. And make all the coffee and try not to screw up copying files, which I did all the time. So after being in the finance business and the mortgage business in Scottsdale, uh, I moved back up to good old Portland. My then wife, uh, now ex-wife, that's a whole other keynote that I'll be giving uh, in the bar later this afternoon. Whole other story, not, not germane to what we're going to talk about today. We wanted to have kids, so that meant a move back to good old Oregon, which really meant a move back to Portland. Um, I went to work for a bank in Portland in the mortgage business. For those of you that know anything about the financial history of the United States, this was in late 2007, early 2008. The perfect time to be in the lending business. It was, it was fantastic. Uh, I went to work for a company called Northwest Mortgage Advisors, and it was here that my life really changed. Uh, I got way into marketing. It was kind of one of those moments where you sort of found your passion one of the reasons I found that passion is because I really sucked at my job as a lending officer. I mean, I, I understood the financial part of it, but, you know, I just wasn't really good on the phone, and it kind of wasn't really where my heart lied. But I loved helping people in the office build brands and tell their stories. So about 15 years ago, I decided to make a pivot away from the lending industry, and I got into marketing. I had a client who worked at kind of this weird local company. They needed a head of marketing. I went to work for them. And then after a couple of years, I found my way to the beer business. I was the head of marketing at Rogue Ales. Then I went to work for Widmer Brothers Brewing, which is a long legacy brewery in the Northwest. And then Kona Brewing Company out of Hawaii, where I got to go on work trips to the big island of Hawaii, which was a super fun little perk. And then finally, about six years ago, I moved up to Seattle and went to work for Elysian Brewing. But it's really Rogue that I'm going to talk about the most here today. I worked for a guy, the founder of Rogue. He was a guy by the name of Jack Joyce. And the thing about Jack is that he was an ex-Nike executive. And not like current day, crazy, you know, multi-billion dollar company Nike. This is like the Nike that was at war with Adidas Nike. Scrappy, guerrilla marketing, trying to build that brand. And he was an absolute genius at that kind of marketing. The other funny thing about Jack is that he was kind of this like older cantankerous guy, right? He was kind of the Steve Jobs of craft beer. His son, who was the president of Rogue, described him, you know, Jack's an asshole, but he's our asshole, right? That was kind of a perfect way to describe him. Jack brings me down into this bunker that he worked out of at the office, real gruff guy, sits me down, and he looks at me straight in the face. And Jack, who before he was at Nike, was a litigator, and the guy could use silence like a weapon. 
So I sit down next to him and he just stares at me for what felt like six years. And he finally says to me, you're not smart enough to do this job. And I'm like, every fear, right, goes through your head. I'm like, well, yeah, I could probably work a fryer at McDonald's, I guess. It was a good run. You know, I was here for a little bit. Long pause, and he goes, but I'm going to teach you how to do this job. And over the course of the next month, he taught me some of the greatest lessons that I've learned about building brands and how do we create stories that resonate. And it's that connection from beer to real estate that I'm really going to try to show today. Because believe it or not, the two industries have a ton in common. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you love beer. I love beer. That's a commonality. You sure as hell were last night. Thank you for that. But the thing about the two industries that are really in common is that they are massively crowded. At any given point in time, there are about 160,000 IPAs on the market. Now, I didn't say beer. I didn't even say adult beverage. I said IPAs. Think about seltzers and canned cocktails and wine, for crying out loud, and spirits. It is a massively competitive market, just like real estate. These are some stats. Now, I'm just a beer guy, so these are some stats I pulled. You know, 3 million active real estate licenses in the U.S. I pulled this from NAR. I'm sure, you know, they're somewhere around this number. doesn't matter if the number's perfect. The point is, is that there are a ton of real estate agents in the country. There's about 106,000 brokerages in the United States. So we're kind of up against sort of the same constraints. Like, think about going to your grocery store. You walk into the grocery store and you go to the cold case and this is what you see. This is what we're up against every single day. Now the funny part about this is this is actually cold doors in a convenience store. This isn't even a Safeway. Safeway is 10 times worse. There are a million different IPAs and a million different brands. And you know what? Here's, here's the thing. All of their beer is great. Every brewery out there right now is brewing awesome beer. It's kind of like in the real estate business, you hear about service. Everybody has great service. Well, you're supposed to have great service. That's kind of the price of entry. So you've got a consumer, walks into the grocery store. You're walking into the grocery store. First of all, research shows us that you're walking into that grocery store with between three and seven brands in your head. And those brands are listed in terms of how much you like them. So you walk into the beer aisle and you've got Elysian Brewing number one and you've got Sierra Nevada number two and you've got Lagunitas number three and that's what you're scanning for. I want an IPA, I'm looking for brands I recognize. I look for number one, I don't see it, then number two, then number three. How long do you think consumers take to make that decision when they're standing in front of that? Shout out a number. 30 seconds? Four seconds, five seconds, getting close. Seven seconds, that's what we have. We have seven seconds to make an impression in that massive wall of beer, and all the beer is great. So what do we do? How do we battle in that crowded market, right? How, how in the world do we go to work every day and make these brands that resonate when we're up against this massive wall of, you know, commoditized competition? And the hint is, is it rhymes with schmarketing, just to kind of not bury the lead here. This is a question I get all the time. Most of the time from like disapproving members of my family that don't understand what I do and think I work in like this weird toy department of alcoholic beverages, which is like half of the way true. Most people think, well, your job, you're just sitting around drinking beer all day. I, I mean, that's sort of true. Well, it depends on the day. Well, it's okay, it's most days, but it, we're tasting it, right? Tasting. But in order to really answer this question, I'm going to introduce you to somebody. I love this guy. I'm going to introduce you to my neighbor, Steve. This is Steve. Steve lives in a little tiny town, a little tiny suburb of Seattle called Bothell. Bothell, yeah, shout out to Bothell. Bothell is like, Bothell's like the, the Pasadena of Washington, right? Like, like think of, you know, I, I lived in Portland for a long time. I think of Beaverton, right? Like it's just kind of your, your idyllic little suburb, right? So Steve lives in this suburb, and I'm, I'm watching the Huskies play Oregon, you know, big rivalry game one day, and, you know, Oregon's winning uh, like 400 to negative 7, something like that. I can't remember the score. And Steve, in his frustration, looks at me, and he starts kind of digging me a little bit about my job. Uh, okay, so you're in marketing for beer, like you just screw around all the time. You know, what kind of stupid job do you have? And his son, Caden, who's pictured here, looks at me and kind of snarkily is like, Nah, Nick, what is marketing? 
And I'm like, all right, Caden, I'll tell you what marketing is. You guys live here in this like nice little suburbs, right? With these like paved roads and these street lights and all this electricity and stuff. If you look outside, your dad's got this brand new Jeep that he bought, right? This Jeep cost him 60 grand and your dad spent another 30 grand putting every weird little trinket on this thing that you can possibly imagine. In fact, this is an old picture. The thing's got like 38 inch tires on it now, right? It has a locking gas cap. Like it's 1972 and people are siphoning gas out of this thing, right? His wife calls it the blueberry miracle. The other funny thing is that Steve's family are big campers. The camper's too heavy to pull with the Jeep. They had to buy another car to pull the camper. This thing even has a winch on it, a winch. Steve lives in Bothell, Washington. He doesn't live in Park City, Utah, right? So I'm telling Caden, think about the Jeep. Like, have you even ever seen your dad touch the winch before, right? And by the way, this isn't germane to just kind of weird, random off-roading vehicles for folks in the suburbs. You sports car folks are in this same boat. I hate to tell you, right? You're in there too with, you know, driving your Porsche to work every morning with your six foot wing on the back of it like you're gonna fly off the road or something like that. We're all there. The thing about the Jeep is, is that it makes Steve feel free. In his mind on his daily commute to Safeway, this is what Steve thinks he's doing, right? <laughs> Doors off on the Jeep, hair flowing in the wind, fog hat on the radio or whatever the hell he's listening to out of this thing. You know, every time he drives by a gaggle of women, they're staring at him and he's, you know, yeah, here we go, I'm in my Jeep. The reality is, is this is what Steve's doing. This is Steve's reality. His, his off-roading is, I mean, frankly, his off-roading is the double speed bump, right? Have you ever seen the double speed bump in, in the parking lot? I mean, that's hardcore. You got to four low on that thing when you get there. It snowed one time in Seattle. We were trying to get out of Steve's driveway in his Jeep and he switched it into four low and it got stuck. And I'm telling you, it was like Christmas when you're eight, eight years old for me. I w oh, I've never been more happy in my life. But when it snows in Seattle, Steve goes crazy. He's out there, you know, saving the world. But I'm telling his son, so your dad lives in the suburbs on these paved roads. He's never taken this thing off road. He owns this $90,000 Jeep that can't tow the trailer that you own and has a winch on it that he can't touch. That's marketing. That's marketing because that Jeep makes your dad feel a certain way about himself. It makes him feel aspirational or it makes him feel like a kid again. It makes him fall in love with the brand. And at the end of the day, that's really what marketing is. Marketing is trying to get our clients, our consumers to fall in love with our brand. A lot of people will be like, well, marketing is a Super Bowl commercial. No, that's advertising. Marketing's my face on a mug. That's merchandising. Well, marketing's my logo. That's graphic design. Marketing is kind of the feeling that all of those are trying to push out there in the world, getting people to fall in love with them. And you know what? We market all the time. You go on a date, you're marketing. You try to put the best version of yourself out there, right? You go in for a job interview, you're marketing every single day. So this is kind of the first two years of your marketing degree. Customers, clients, falling in love with your brand. The next two years of your degree are this, and really the rest of your career in marketing is okay, great, but how in the hell do we do that? How in the hell do we get people to fall in love with our brand? The truth is, is that we're all selling a product in some way, shape, and form, whether it's the service we give or the house that you're trying to buy or the beer we're trying to push out there on the market, we're all selling a product, but if you take a big step back, what we're really selling is an experience. We're selling an experience of having that product, of what that product can do for you, of what that product you know, brings to your life, of how it can make you feel. Jeep is selling an experience. Yeah, they're selling four tires and a winch and a, 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 you know, a roof, but which by the way, Steve's never taken the top off the Jeep, right? Uh, but it's the experience. The scene behind is a shot of our pumpkin fest at Elysian. Every single October, end of September, October, we have the Great Pumpkin Beer Fest in Seattle. 80 different beers on tap, about 40 of them are pumpkin beers, 4,000 people over two days. 
and it is an absolute distillation of what the brand is. Yeah, it's a beer festival. There's a bunch of beer on tap. You can come try out that beer, but it's more than that. We have a costume contest. No, unfortunately, this woman didn't win. Uh, but we have a costume contest, and people dress up for this thing. People fly in from all over the country for it. We have a pumpkin pie eating contest. This is our creative director, also didn't win. Sorry, David, super gross. We grab a 1,500-pound pumpkin from these crazy pumpkin growers in Washington, and we fill it full of beer. It takes about six kegs, by the way. We fill it full of beer, and our cellarman, Dano, jumps up there with about a three-foot drill bit, and he taps it. And then we take that beer, and we try to put it in these, you know, big, giant pitchers, and we serve it to all of the customers that are there. We serve it to all of our raving fans that are there, and they're happy as hell. Now, again, here's kind of a hack for the beer business. Free beer goes a long way. Like, it goes a long way to making customers happy, trust me. But how do we get to there? How do we get to there from just, oh, we got an idea for a brew fest, right? We, oh, we'll put a bunch of beer on tap and we'll invite people. That's how that started. The brewers screwed up brewing pumpkin beer 20 years ago at Elysian. They made too much. And at that point in time, you can't just dump the beer. That's like liquid gold, you know? The company isn't making that much money. So they decided to put it on tap, invite people, you know, hey, we've got multiple pumpkin beers on tap. And over the course of 20 years, it went from just some random pumpkin beers on tap to that brand experience. But how do we get there? And that's where this blueprint comes in and these big four lessons that I learned all those years ago from Jack. And I'm going to take you through the four lessons now and really not only how they work in the beer business, but how they can work in your business. You know, again, the two areas having that commonality of big time competition. The promise, something I call triple USIM, listening, and then olfactory fatigue. So let's jump into it. The first one is the promise. My favorite lesson to bring up in front of brewers, it drives them crazy. Jack would always say, I don't care how a beer tastes, I care if it lives up to its promise. And what he meant by that is that if you have a chocolate stout in your hand, does that beer live up to what a chocolate stout should be. The packaging, the taste, how it makes you feel. Do you get the hit of chocolate stout from it? Now look, you can go full nerd on beer. And I mean full nerd on beer. Oh, the hop interplay between the malt build and the nose and, you know, the finish is a little wet cardboard for me and the diacetyl overtones and you're just like big time snore, right? It's kind of like wine. Jack cut through all of that. The beer is supposed to be good. I don't care how the beer tastes. Does it live up to its promise? What is the promise that your brand is putting out there? What is the promise that your company is putting out there? Is it attainable? Is it you're going to have a perfect transaction every time? Or you're never going to miss out on the property? Or this is going to be the easiest thing? You, I mean, none of those are true. They can't be true. Does it live up to its promise? Is that chocolate stout living up to its promise of chocolate stout? It's a little bit different for every single person, but you can do it if you keep that at its, at its core. We have a beer we're working on right now, sitting in sensory panel where we taste the beer and, you know, with the brewers, and I'm in there pissing everybody off saying, does it live up to its promise? Come on, guys, does it live up to its promise? The next lesson is my favorite one, and I say this to my team all the time. I bring it up all the time. The guy pictured on the left is a really well-known guy named Rob Strasser. If you've seen the Nike movie Air, he's played by Jason Bateman. Rob Strasser was the first marketing director at Nike, really well-known guy in Portland, and he worked with Jack on kind of the creation of Rogue in its beginning. The other guy, Peter Moore, is the guy that designed the first Air Jordan 1 and the Jumpman logo. And they were both instrumental with Jack in building the brand. And Rob would always say that there are these six things that every great brand and great marketing initiative should have as at its core. And if you can hit these six things, you've got something special. I kind of codenamed it Triple USIM because it just sort of helps me remember it. Uh, but I've got a little bit of a, of a pivot on it that I'll share with you here in a couple of slides. But those six things, the big six, simple, 
interesting, meaningful, unique, understandable, and unexpected. He actually wrote it on a piece of butcher paper and they had it framed in the rogue office. Have you ever watched a Super Bowl commercial and you think to yourself, that is the shittiest commercial I've ever seen in my life. It's probably missing one of these six things. It's probably too complicated or it's not interesting or it doesn't mean anything to anybody or it's not unique and, or you can't understand it. A lot of times these commercials try to be too creative and you can't understand it. One of the ways I describe this to folks is I talk about Steve Jobs launching the first iPod. How did he launch it? 10,000 songs in your pocket. Simple. Interesting. MP3 players were out, but not an MP3 player from Apple. It was expected, but the look of it was also unexpected. It was unique because of how it worked with the click wheel. Nobody had done that before. 10,000 songs in your pocket. Simple, interesting, meaningful, unique, understandable, and unexpected. I'll give you a couple examples of how this works. Any parents in here? Raise your hand. Yeah, I got three kids myself. What is it about kids that they hate vegetables? I, I feel like in medieval times when there was nothing but vegetables to eat, kids would still hate vegetables. I, I also don't understand the noodle fascination with kids. Like, my kids love noodles for some weird reason. When they were little, it was spaghetti, and then it was macaroni and cheese, and now for some crazy reason, they're addicted to ramen. Like, I, I was never a big ramen person when I was a kid, but now the kids can't, you know, they eat ramen incessantly. My now wife, by the way, fun fact, uh, one time I was giving this keynote and I said my current wife. Uh, don't say current wife, say now wife. Uh, my wife was in the audience, and uh, let's just say I got some very constructive feedback after that. Not current wife, which is like a for now wife. No, my now wife, right? Like uh, Jackie, love of my life. Uh, if anybody's recording, right? Love, love of my life, uh, Jackie. Um, we have a friend, Linda. Linda has a son, Bentley, and Bentley hated vegetables, right? Hated them. So Linda had an idea, and here's the thing about Linda that you don't know. Linda is a world-renowned pasta chef. And what she did is she figured out a way to make colored, bright, vibrant pasta using vegetables as the color source. So you get all of the color and all of the vitamins of vegetables, but in pasta. This is all pasta that she made, yes, including the Betty White pasta. Um, she goes by Salty Seattle, and she has a new product out that's called Crokey. It's croissant-based gnocchi, and all of the colors are from vegetables. Simple, interesting, meaningful, unique. Most of the time, colors come from food colorings and crappy additives. These are straight from vegetables. The red's from beets, the orange is from carrots, and so on. Understandable, pasta, it's colored with vegetables, the end. And unexpected. These boxes of pasta sell for about $30 a box, and they can't keep them on the shelves. Super awesome when you hit those six things in a big way. So this is a win. I'm going to show you how I screwed this all up. Let me introduce you to Skull Rock. What? Exactly. Skull Rock. This is a beer that we did at Elysian that was phenomenal. Phenomenal. Light kind of juicy. God, you could just drink it all day. It was like 4.8% alcohol. We put it on tap at Crystal Mountain, which is like the big ski resort in Seattle. And I swear you could just leave the tap on all day and you wouldn't spill a drop. People couldn't get enough of it. So we decided to package it. Well, like how most of these creative decisions happen, we had one of the founders in the room and he wanted to go a certain direction with it. The beer was brewed with something that's called kvike yeast. And without going down a long, boring, nerdy, drawn-out explanation of what kvike yeast is, it's Nordic. And so he wanted to go into that Nordic lane, and he's like, what if this beer was a death metal band, and, and the label looked like a poster for this death metal band on a light post in Capitol Hill in Seattle? So we went that direction and completely screwed it up. First of all, it makes you think that it's a dark beer inside. The beer's light but a black can, the customers didn't know what to think. Am I getting a stout? Am I getting something dark? And then the name, nobody could even say the name. And if you can say the name, what does that mean? Nobody knew. 
And it's also called out Nordic style IPA. What, what, what does that mean? Like nobody knew what this stuff meant. So is it simple? No, it's really complicated. Is it interesting? I mean, I guess it looks like nightmare fuel for crying out loud. If you buy this and your kids see it at two in the morning, you're screwed. They're never going to sleep again. Is it meaningful? Well, I don't know what the damn name means. How can it be meaningful if I don't know what it means? It's unique, but in a bad way. It, you can't understand it. And I guess it's sort of unexpected. Completely flopped. Couldn't sell it. Phenomenal beer. One of the best beers we've made at Elysian. Couldn't sell it. The flip side of this coin is something that happened last Halloween. We got a call from NBC Universal, and they wanted to do a partnership with us. They love what we do for Pumpkin Fest and with our pumpkin beers. We're really well known for them. And they had an idea. They were launching season two of a TV series, and they're like, we think we've got the perfect collaboration for you. What do you think if we did a beer together? And we talked with them, and this thing just made sense. So we launched a killer wit beer for Chucky with NBC Universal last Halloween. The killer wit beer, our head of communications was at breakfast with her husband. She's having coffee. She's like, I can't figure out what to call this beer. I mean, it's, it's Chucky, right? But I need a style call out. And he's like, oh, you should just say it's killer. Home run. We could not keep this stuff on the shelves. We had people calling the offices. I'll do whatever it takes to get some of this beer. I love it. I'm a huge Chucky fan. Incidentally, they actually sent us a Chucky doll. It came in this huge box. The damn thing's three feet tall. If we kept it, it cost 10 grand. We sent it back. Our head of uh, content put it in his office window with a red light shining on it, and it damn near scared one of our folks on our team half to death. It is terrifying. But this beer flew off the shelf again. Simple, interesting, meaningful, unique. Elysian, big pumpkin brand. We do a ton of stuff around Halloween. Makes sense that they would do Chucky on a, on a can. Super unexpected, super understandable. People loved it. Third lesson, listen. So interesting how the simple lessons are the hardest lessons. At Elysian, the number one question that we get on social media, and it's not even close, is where can I find your beer? We post a picture of a beer. There are 10 questions in the comments. I'm in El Paso, Texas. Where can I get it? I'm in, you know, Salem, Oregon. Where can I get it? Here's a little bit of beer history. Here's a little bit of alcohol history. Because of prohibition, you have all these weird prohibition laws in the alcohol industry. I can't tell you, go to Safeway on 3rd Street and buy our beer. It's unfair competition. It's called retailer assistance. I can't say, go to the Chevron on 27th by your house and buy Space Dust. I can't say that. So when you ask on social media, I live in Los Angeles, where can I buy your beer? We can't tell you anything. We can say, go talk to your wholesaler, but that's a fool's errand. We can say, go to your local retailer. Well, no shit, right? But we can't tell you where to go. So what did we do? We built a fancy website. We got into redoing our website, and oh, look at all the graphics that we did, and we've got this funny age gate, and aren't we super creative, and the doors open when you, when you say that you're 21, and we've got really cool pictures on there. Meanwhile, all of our customers are like, where can I get your beer? Yeah, yeah I, I know, where can you get our beer? But look at the stickers on the door. Yeah, I, I know, but where can I get your beer? It took us about eight months, and we finally went, hey, you know what we should do? Let's develop some kind of app on the website that you can put in your zip code, and all of the places where our beer is found around you, geotagged by your phone or by your laptop, will pop up. Huh, amazing. We did this, sales went through the roof. Not only did sales go through the roof, now all of a sudden we've got a way to respond to people. Instead of not responding when they ask, where can I find your beer in El Paso, Texas, we go, go to the beer finder. Not only do we push traffic to the website, we give them a warm fuzzy because we answered their question. Everything's great. So there's a flip side to this where it works poorly. And I got to give it up to one of our, our fellow brothers and sisters in the industry, Goose Island. They built this app. They, they spent all this money building an app where you could take a virtual tour of their brewery. 
It was really cool. It was like all this virtual reality stuff. This was done like a handful of years ago. Really, really cool stuff. The only problem, breweries aren't really that interesting. Picture a giant steel tank. The end. That's every brewery visit you're ever going to go to in your life. Well, our, our tanks are, we have six tanks over here. Well, we've got one tank over here and one tank over here. But it's still stainless steel and it still looks like every other tank in the industry. And it absolutely died. People didn't care. People wanted to know where they could get their beer. You take the flip side of that coin, there's a little tiny brand in Oregon called Great Notion. They built this whole website based on launching new beers. And they used the drop culture from sneakers to do it. Tiny brand. They gamified it. You sign up for an account for this. You get notifications. And it's lit their business on fire. Because they listened to their customers. Their customers wanted info about their beer. They make these wild beers. Wild. And people flip out over them. Brilliant. Listen to your customers. Listen to your clients. What are your clients saying about the process that we're not listening to? What is the, where can I find your beer? Oh yeah, but look at this new app that we developed. Oh, but we changed the animation on the website. Yeah, but where can I find your beer? What are clients saying? Where's that pain point? Oftentimes we don't look at it because it's hard to figure out a solution. But when you figure out that solution, business gets lit on fire. When I was in high school, I took a trip. I was on the uh, student council, and myself and my fellow nerds took a trip to the Oregon coast for a, a leadership retreat, and we had this advisor. She was amazing, and she drove us back in the day when you could, you know, kind of do that sort of thing in her, in her Astro minivan. Remember those? Uh, she drove us in her Astro minivan to the coast. It was about a, you know, maybe an hour drive. So we go to her house, and you know we're getting ready to pack up the van. And what we didn't know is that she had two standard poodles. Do you know what a standard poodle is? It's not a, a toy poodle. The toy poodle is the pom-poms on the knees one. A standard poodle is like if you took six wet mops and made them walk around on all four legs. She had two of them, and it, it was like they lived in a swamp. And when we got into her car, it was overwhelming, like overwhelming. And of course, we're in high school, so we acted like it was grim death. Well, we're driving, and about, you know, 15 minutes later, everybody's fine. And the reason why everybody's fine is because as human beings, we have this weird neurological adaptation that's called olfactory fatigue. It's like you can't feel your ass in the seat right now until I say ass in the seat, now you can feel it, or your feet in your shoes, now you can feel them. Like you get used to your surroundings. It's supposed to be, you know, when we're, when we're out in the woods and a tiger's around the corner going to eat us and we can smell the new thing in our environment. It's also why, uh, you know, eighth grade Nick, you shouldn't put 19 sprays of Dracar Noir when you're going to the eighth grade dance because you might not be able to smell it after five minutes, but Devin, your date, is gagging in the bathroom because she can smell it nonstop. Olfactory fatigue. The weird thing about olfactory fatigue is that it happens with our brands. It happens with our propositions. This is a product called Odd Water. It's Elysian's first kind of foray into what we call beyond beer, what, but what really is just anything not beer, canned cocktails, seltzers, that kind of stuff. Essentially what this is, is it's a hoppy, citrusy version of LaCroix. It's like what would happen if a brewery made LaCroix? We worked on it for two and a half years. By the time we launched it, we were so sick of looking at it and talking about it and looking at different label proofs that we were kind of over it. But what we didn't know is that customers had never seen it before. And we really kind of missed the boat on launching it the first, the first go around because we didn't really think anybody would care because we kind of didn't care. You know, everybody in this room, you're so used to the real estate transaction. You're so used to your world, the ins and outs of it. You know, have you ever had something happen in a transaction where it's like really not that big of a deal, but your client's freaking out? The reason their client's freaking out is because it, you have olfactory fatigue over it. You've been through it 10 million times, and you don't recognize it as the big deal that perhaps a client would. This lesson is make sure that you don't lose the smell of your brand. 
that you don't lose the smell of that proposition. So those are the big four lessons. Now the triple use in one, I'm working on rejiggering it a little bit. And what I did is I created something just for everybody here at FubCon. If you go to nickmallory.com slash FubCon, I created a one-sheeter about the triple use in, and I kind of reframed it as simple, that simple, interesting, meaningful. You can download it, you can frame it and put it in your bathroom, you can do whatever you want. But it's really helpful of that one big lesson. I talk to that lesson all the time to my team uh, about the triple USIM. It, it's so, so, so powerful. And everything we do, we try to put it through that lens. Now, I've got one more. And this is the bonus lesson. And this is the big one. And honestly, this is the hard one. This lesson's called the Makita. The Makita, Jack would tell us, is an Inuit word for the truth that isn't spoken or the unspeakable truth. The reality is, is I've Googled this thing for hours and I can't find it anywhere. So I think Jack was totally making it up. But that goes back to another one of Jack's awesome sayings, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. I'm going to tell you how the Makita works. This is a hard look in the mirror because you're asking the unaskable question that everybody knows is true. I'll give you an example for real estate. You don't need a realtor to buy a house. But if you start there, then maybe you get to, okay, you don't need a realtor to buy a house, but you sure, sure as hell need a realtor to buy the house. If you start from that hard look, then it opens up the uniqueness of your proposition. I'll give you an example of how this works in beer. And I ask this question all the time. The world doesn't need another IPA. Elysian is an IPA brewery from the IPA region of the country, the Northwest. The world doesn't need another IPA. I told you a few slides ago, there's 160,000 of them in the country. Every brewery out there brews six of them. The world doesn't need another one. But we got to brew another one because that's what we do. So what do you do? You start with the Makita. Okay, if the world doesn't need another IPA, then what? So we have a brewer at one of our pilot breweries. He brews this phenomenal hazy IPA. And if you think IPAs are saturated, hazy IPAs, geez, are just everywhere. But God, this beer was so good. And like a classic brewer, these brewers always name their beers. And of course, God bless them, they always name them some trademarked name, right, that you're going to get sued immediately for. He called it Cheeto Fingers. Great. Yeah, Frito-Lay, yeah, Nick at Elysian. Just send your lawyers over. We're fine. So we asked him, we're like, okay, why Cheeto Fingers? And he's like, well, when I was brewing it, you know, the color of it, it just kind of reminded me of being a kid and getting that dust on my fingers, and I'd put it all over the place in the house, and my mom would get really mad at me. And we were like, okay, nostalgia. That's our end. We go nostalgic on it. Elysian was started in 1996. There were less than 500 craft breweries when Elysian started. There are almost 10,000 now. Talk about saturation. What about 1996? Okay, let's call it Hazy 96, the year that we started. And let's put something nostalgic on the box. I got it, a VHS tape. Remember what those VHS tapes looked like with the bands and the stickers on them? I mean, you could almost hear the rattle of this thing, right? By the way, it also makes me feel a thousand years old because I showed it to my kids and they're like, what is that? And I started crying. I'm like, what do you mean, what is this? Be kind, rewind. You don't know be kind, rewind? What do you mean rewind? Don't you just download it? Oh, you're, ground, you're grounded, you're grounded, you're grounded. Go to your room. But people really dig this product and they get it, they get the nostalgia. And it's more than just a hazy IPA, which there's a million of out there on the market. It harkens back to 1996, gets people feeling a certain way. The world doesn't need another IPA. I love this lesson, and it's super, super hard. It's a hard look in the mirror, but I promise you, it's a gateway to getting that simple, interesting, meaningful. So let's wrap this up. Our big lessons, the promise. Does it live up to its promise? I don't care what a beer tastes like. I care if it lives up to its promise. What's the promise you're putting out there from your brand? What's the promise you're giving to your clients, to your customers? 
the big one, my favorite one, again, go to nickmallory.com slash fubcon and, and download this printable, frameable one-sheeter. Uh, the, the triple use simple, interesting, meaningful, unique, understandable, and unexpected. If you find a way to nail these six things for your brand proposition, you've got something really special. If you find that your brand proposition isn't hitting its mark, I would bet you a buffalo nickel it's missing one of these six. It's too complicated. It's like everybody else's. It's hard to understand. Listen, what are your clients saying that you're not paying attention to? Or what are your clients saying that you're redirecting? Where can I find your beer? Look at how fancy our website is. Yeah, great, but where can I find your beer? Olfactory fatigue. Remember those poodles. Good Lord, do I remember those poodles. Remember, you're used to your brand. You're used to the industry. You're used to the way these things work. Your clients aren't. Remember, think of your customer journey through fresh eyes and through a fresh experience. And then finally, the bonus one, the tough one, the Makita the hard question that needs to be asked, the perfect place to start. The world doesn't need another IPA. Just remember that next time you go to the grocery store and buy the six cases of Elysian beer that you're gonna buy from now on, please. Uh, myself and my kids would really appreciate it. So we've talked about a lot of lessons. What does this look like when it all comes together? I'll give you an example from Elysian. In 2012, we designed Space Dust. You might know Space Dust from Elysian. It's our number one brand. It's huge down here in LA. It's all across the country. But we started with the world doesn't need another IPA. So we gotta, we gotta make something special. Now we knew at the time that the brewers had a really amazing recipe. Classic West Coast IPA. Super easy to drink, super strong. But we had to do something else. The world doesn't need another IPA. So we started where every good marketing team starts in the beer industry. We started with the label. These are the first illustrations of the Space Dust label. We kind of had like this 50 sci-fi attack of the 50-foot woman, the blob kind of thing going on, you know, when hops attack and that sort of thing. But one night our founder, one of our founders, now he'll tell you that he was drunk or stoned or both, uh, was Googling the name Space Dust. I told you that brewers like to use trademarked names for their beers. But the thing about Space Dust is that it was brewed with Galaxy Hops, which at the time were this hops that you could get from Australia. And by the time they made the journey from Australia, the hops were all smashed in the bag. You're dumping the hops in the kettle. At the bottom of the bag, the hops had turned into dust, Galaxy Dust, Space Dust. I said brewers like trademark names. I didn't say they're geniuses. So Space Dust was the name. So he Googles Space Dust and almost immediately has a heart attack when he sees this. So what he sees is that back in the 70s, there was a candy that was made by General Foods. And what's the one thing General Foods has more of than anything else? Lawyers. So he's like, oh shit. Well, here we go. So he starts dialing, the, he starts dialing numbers. And by some magical miracle, he gets a hold of the legal crew at General Foods. And he says, hey, stupid Seattle brewer here. We got this beer. It's named Space Dust. We're going to put it in package. Like, can we license this name from you? And they go, oh, that's something we did in the 70s. We rebranded that. It's called Pop Rocks now. You can have it. We'll sign it over to you. Oh, shit, okay, thanks. They sent us a letter, Space Dust is yours, take it and run with it. And the orange, either spitting or puking or snorting, nobody knows really what it is, the orange Space Dust finally turns into this. And now we've got a beer that lives up to its promise. This is a classic West Coast IPA that is something different. We've got a cartoon on the label, right? Lives up to its promise. We build a campaign for it that we launched two years ago. Simple, interesting, meaningful, unique, understandable, and unexpected. You go into a bar, you see the Space Dust tap handle, you ask the bartender, Space Dust, what is that? He or she will look at you and go, you know what, it's just a great IPA, go ahead and grab one. And the campaign took off like wildfire. We started asking our customers, what do you love about this brand? What's unique about the brand? What really turns you on about the brand? And all of them said two things. We love Dusty, the little hop, and we love how funny your guys' brand is. So we leaned into the humor and we launched these digital ads. It's a hop, not an artichoke. 
We always heard people say all the time, why do you have an artichoke on your can? It's a, it's a hop, it's not an artichoke, but you know, thanks. People loved it, it scored off the, off the charts. But it's been around for 10 years, kind of getting that old factory fatigue. You know, people think it's interesting, but you know, well, what do we do? Well, we want to come up with some new news. So we do that the only way we know how. We center it around a date on the calendar that I am legally, contractually obligated to tell you falls between 419 and 421 on the calendar. And we came up with dank dust. What we did is we got some hop terpenes, we loaded up this beer, and when you open it, let's just say it smells a certain way. This represents my favorite conversation I have ever had with someone from the legal department at our company. Now, bear in mind, this is a real lawyer who went to a real law school. I had a conversation with him about how low Dusty's eyelids can go. They, they can't go down so far to where he looks stoned, but they can go down to where he looks tired. And no shit, I sat on a phone call with our graphic designer, and I'm like, how about here? Too low. How about here? Too low. How about here? That's good. Okay, push print. Glad you got that, you know, six-figure law school education to sit here and tell me how low eyelids need to be. But new news, we launched Dank Dust last year. It lit our brand on fire. It lit people internally on fire. We started building a family for space dust. And that family extends next year with juice dust, another product that we've been working really hard to make sure that lives up to its promise. If we've got this beer out there called juice dust with a label that looks like that, you can get an idea of what that thing should taste like when you crack it open. And what happened is space dust took off like crazy. When we first brewed it in 2012 to all the way up to 2022, now remember I told you there are 160,000 IPAs on the market. Space Dust is number four in this country. Sierra Nevada, well, <laughs> thank you. It was all because of me, I appreciate it. And my, yeah, they were like, Nick, you did this all, congratulations. But number four, number four behind three other brands I can't remember at this point in time. Uh, so why does this all matter? Kind of a final similarity between beer and real estate. And if you forgive me for a second, we're gonna get a little Hallmark movie of the week right now. We're gonna get a little touchy-feely. One of the things about beer that is really analogous to what you all do is that we're a part of big occasions. We say in the beer business that beer is an occasion-based product. And what we mean by that is that you enjoy beer with other people. Sometimes you do alone, sure, but most of the time, beer is there for big occasions. A barbecue for the 4th of July, celebrating a birthday, celebrating a birth. The awesome thing about beer is it's kind of recession-proof, too. People drink when they're happy, people drink when they're sad. So the pandemic hits, we got space dust in grocery stores, sales went through the roof. Pandemic ends, people are going into bars, we got space dust on draft, people are drinking it like crazy. But everybody in this room, you're part of one of the biggest occasions out there. You've got marriage, maybe a couple of times if you're me. You've got kids, big job, and a house. I mean, that's like one of the big four occasions. And we're part of that. And there's an opportunity through following these crazy lessons from Jack to really stand out in this sea of sameness and be an integral part of those occasions by developing brands and propositions that resonate. Final lesson, Jack would always say, marketing is just a sense of humor, a good gut, and a way to look at the world. He would always tell people, don't ever let anybody tell you you're not creative enough to do a marketer. You might not be smart enough to be a marketer, but it's teachable, just like Jack sat me down and taught me these lessons all those years ago. A sense of humor, a good gut, and a way to look at the world. So follow these lessons, the promise, triple use him, listen, watch out for olfactory fatigue, remember the hard look in the mirror of the Makita, and if you want to, go to nickmallory.com slash fubcon, download that one cheater so you can pass that out to folks at your team and kind of spread the word on all of this stuff. 
Thanks, everybody. Reach out, connect. We'll talk beer. I appreciate the time.